Hi, I'm Eric Johnson from Tuck TV, and I'm here today with Window Schneider, Chief Security something or other from Mozilla Corporation. Uh, welcome, Ms. Schneider. Thank you. Is it true you've been a technology nerd since you were five? I did get started pretty early, but um, I did have two parents that were both software engineers. Um, so at age five, I had a, a TI-99 that I was learning to program in BASIC on. So I was, I was definitely excited about computers at an early age. Within the security community, there's long been a debate between public and private announcement of vulnerabilities. What are your thoughts about that? I think there's always this, this balance that you're trying to strike between making the information available so that people understand the problem, they understand the severity of the, of the issue, they understand um, maybe what mitigations they can, they can put in place to protect themselves or their infrastructure. Um, and having that information is critical to be able to do these things. But at the same time, you don't want to give attackers extra information um, that they can use to hurt your users or, um, or hurt your customers. We want to make as much information publicly available as possible because we do want people to be able to make their own decisions for their own infrastructure. And we do have a huge community of people who are trying to help us secure our users. So making information available to them helps them evaluate the situation um, um, as well. But we do want to make sure that the, we get the fix out as quickly as possible so that the window of opportunity for the attacker is, is as small as possible. And there are two factors that really contribute to the overall window of risk. And the first of these is how long from the point of time um, that the, from how long from when the vulnerability has been identified does it take for the vendor to get a fix out there. And that's something that we can really um, impact significantly. So we um, make sure that we get that fix out as quickly as possible. But the other factor is how long does it take for the user to get that fix deployed once it's available? Because the attacker doesn't care if their user's not patched because there's no fix available or because the user hasn't installed it yet, the user's still vulnerable. So making um, both of those uh, factors as, as small as possible is one of the things that we're doing. But after that point, once the users get the fix deployed, there's no reason not to make that information available because it is still useful for people doing research to try and figure out um, you know, um, are, are there going to be similar issues like, like that out there? Are there um, other mitigations that we can put in place that would um, mitigate a broad category of vulnerabilities instead of, um, you know, always having to wait, wait for uh, the vulnerability to be patched? We know that 90% 90, 90 of our users are updated within, um, within four days, which is, uh, which is pretty amazing um, when, you, when you consider we have 200 million users and um, getting, getting an update out there as quickly as possible is something that we've, we've really put a lot of emphasis on. And you, you see it through features like uh, Session Restore, which doesn't look like a security feature on, 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 uh, on, at the surface, right? But one of the reasons that users are able to get updated so quickly is because when they see their, the, 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 um, the security update uh, presented to them, they know that even if they're in the middle of something, they can go ahead and accept that update because when the browser restarts, they're going to be right back where they started with all their um, tabs open to where they were, all the websites that they were working on. You often use the term threat modeling. What do you mean by that? One of the, 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 uh, the most important things we're trying to accomplish with threat modeling is understanding the overall risk the application faces. So identifying the entry points to the system, the assets within, within, within the system, and, and uh, you know, tracing the data flows to the application to identify how the attacker, um, what, what risks are, um, are present and how to mitigate those. And if you're tolerating a risk, um, it's best to know that you're actually tolerating it as opposed to, you know, like, opposed to finding out later that you have this risk, you're not doing anything about it, and it, maybe it was a conscious decision, but it's not documented, and maybe it was a conscious decision by uh, you know, people who are in control of this one component of the system, but it's, it's not acknowledged that the, um, by the rest of the uh, owners of other components, and there needs to be a unified uh, measure of, of all the different uh, risks of the system and, and what we're doing about each of these different threats. So threat modeling, for, for me, is, is uh, identifying these risks and also the mitigations we have in place and evaluating whether or not these mitigations are sufficient. Many think of security as a kind of secret backroom activity. Of course, that doesn't work in your world. Uh, what does security mean in an open, collaborative environment? And how do you direct that? The, the tendency to keep it as a, a secret backroom activity is uh, it's understandable. It's, this is information that can be used to hurt your users, and it's dangerous. And so, of course, you want to make sure that you're not, can, you're not helping attackers. Um, but at the same time, this um, information can also be used to help protect your users. So how do you, how do you balance those this, this, this two objectives, keeping the user safe and also um, enabling um, the community to protect the users as well? And um, one of the things that we found is that when we make this information open, um, especially if we, if we find other ways to mitigate our risk, that we are able to uh, take advantage of you know, this, this wealth of information in the community. So 
what we have, uh, the way we operate is we've got a group of, of um, contributors that call the security group. And there's about 120 people in the security group right now. And these are people that are, some of them are Mozilla uh, employees, and some of these people are contributors from the community, individual contributors. Some of these people work for different um, vendors that, that have a stake in, in, in Firefox security or different Mozilla products. And um, these are people who are, who've been contributing to security efforts over time. And it's a self-selecting group. These are people who've been nominated by each other um, to, to participate. Like if someone's been working on a, on, a, on a vulnerability or a set of vulnerabilities, someone will say, hey, that person really should be part of the security group because they've been doing a lot of great work. And someone else will, not, will, will second the nomination and they're in the group. And that's, that's you know, it's, 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 it's a, it's a self-organizing um, uh, group. And then these people have access to the security vulnerabilities that we know about and that we're working on. That means that we've get, we, we're able to get uh, uh, feedback and, you know, on, on the fixes that we're doing. Is this the, is this the right way to do it? Is, um, is there maybe a, a better solution out there? Um, is this going to be? Is this going to make it mitigate the the the, uh, the problems efficiently? And we'll, we'll we'll be able to get feedback in real time while we're working on a, on an open issue, and but but get but get um, contribution from from a, a broader a broader audience than maybe would if if, if a traditional vendor only had like their security team that had access to it or their the um, the, uh, the the uh, development team that was actually working on on fixing the problem. Um, so that's one way that we help. We also reach out to the security community and say. Um, you know, these are the tools that we're using. You know, help us make them better. You know, this, there's a there's a huge security research community out there that are constantly looking for vulnerabilities in software. And the way they work with traditional vendors is once the software is shipped, they have an opportunity to bang away at it and, and do penetration testing on it and see see what kind of vulnerabilities they can find. But with because our process is so open, they're able to participate at different um, uh, stages of the development process, which means that they can call into some of our meetings, our design meetings, and say, "Oh, this is what you guys are thinking about doing. Well, consider this this threat that maybe you haven't um, you don't have yet." Documented in your threat model, or consider this um, this way of doing things that that you know might uh, enable all these different scenarios, but also be more secure. So they're able to contribute at, at different points in the process because they don't have to wait for us to ship something and and and, and then take a look at it. They can uh, look at the source code while we're in, in implementation. They can participate in the development meetings while we're, while we're doing design. Um, they can um, edit our threat models. So they will be able to soon as we're at, we're, we're working on making those. Um, available, and one of the goals of making our threat models available is so that we have this this benefit of contribution that like people can take a look at these mitigations and say like, okay, well you think it's mitigated, but in reality there's there's this other uh, factor they hadn't considered. If you have that feedback during the design process, the cost of changing it might just be wiping something off a whiteboard and drawing it differently, right? Whereas if you get that implementation after it's been deployed to 200 million users, then the cost of changing that might be a, a pretty significant investment in development time, not to mention an update for our users and, and so on. So it's a little bit um, it, well, it's, it's significantly more costly to do it later in the development process. So any way that we can incorporate uh, this kind of feedback earlier in the development process from the security research community, it's going to be a benefit to us and to, and to Firefox users. Many industries face uh, significant regulations around their product quality. And, and now some large uh, corporate users, IT users, are calling for regulation in the IT industry. What would that mean for an organization like Mozilla? I think it would probably be the same for other vendors as it would be for Mozilla, but I think the the uh, the question for for commercial and non-commercial software vendors is the same: is how how would you go about uh, regulating security software uh, software security? Right now, um, even vendors with the with the best intentions, with you know infinite resources to throw at it, are still trying to evaluate which of their processes are effective and um, which are most effective and whether or not they got a reasonable return on their investment for the um, security work that they did do and whether they're getting diminishing returns on you know, more uh, security work, whether that's penetration testing or source code review or threat modeling or um, integrating tools. and uh, it, it's. Uh, it's it's difficult to measure security because you're trying to measure a negative, right? You only notice it when it fails. So um, so how do you evaluate that? And I think we'll also get to this point where we don't where we recognize that um, even if you do all the right things as a as a software vendor, you're 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 trying to defend um, something that you you um, you have to be right 100% of the time, and the attacker only has to be right once. And to protect against something like that is incredibly difficult. It, they, we don't have a an analogy for it, like you know, like bridge building or or, or medicine. There's no there's no um, there there are no uh, uh, sure things in security. There's always going to be something that we haven't thought about yet, or or software end up, end up, might end up being used in a way that you're not expecting it to be used. Well, thank you again for talking with us today, Window. Well, thank you. It's great to be here.